the historical roots of the rapidly expanding cult of Mary with the worship of ancient goddesses and other pagan practices have been examined in an earlier chapter. Such links now seem to strengthen what we assumed before, or even proved before. The New Age movement is undoubtedly advancing on many fronts, not least in the Church, which will not endure sound doctrine, having itching ears. Many Christians have drunk deep drafts of New Age potions. For example, holistic health, hypnosis, yoga, inner healing, meditation, psychical research and awareness training, and many have imbibed new doctrines and heresies based on the humanistic and positive thinking of Taylor de Chardin, Norman Vincent Peale and others which provide the church with its emphasis on an earthly kingdom now, the social gospel and society reconstructed for Christianized with kingdom principles for the Lord's return. Restorationist leader Bryn Jones, writing in the beginning of 1991, promised his followers that, quote, by the power of his spirit, we will bring all that is against God and man beneath Christ's authority. God's church will be the most influential body of people on earth in the final period of this age. Unquote. This is indeed a prophetic word, but it is fulfilled in scripture only by the apostate church of the book of Revelation. Hello everybody and especially my brothers and sisters in Christ. This is Jörg once again from Joggler 66, Hour of the Truth. Today I'm going to read uh, Ecumenical Dangers, as the video is called, which is chapter 5 of the fantastic book All Roads Lead to Rome, the Ecumenical Movement by Michael Desemlian. Ecumenical Dangers and the undertitle of the book The Ecumenical Movement, so this is quite important to understand. I'm glad to be here to read the fifth chapter in succession and I'm always looking forward to all the other chapters still coming and it's quite an, uh, how, how do you say that, um, challenge to read in German and English at the same time. I can tell you the book that I will read afterwards is the same. It's also in German and English, and I'm very much looking forward to that one already. But first, let us go really into the ecumenical dangers in all roads lead to Rome. The dangers of doctrinal compromise for evangelicals are compounded by the fact that the Greek Orthodox Church, a founder of the World Council of Churches, embraces largely the same traditions as Rome. Apart from the major disagreement in the past relating to papal supremacy, there are few real differences in dogma between Roman, Greek and other Orthodox churches, like the Russian Orthodox Church. I don't know about you in the United States of America, for example, but in Germany there are a lot of people who say, oh, Putin is such a wonderful guy. They don't understand that all these politicians on the top are controlled by the Jesuits. Putin also, he's a Freemason. And you can find proof of that on the internet. I don't have to provide that here. Do your own research on that. But that's uh, very much the true. And Freemasonry on the top is controlled by the General of the Society of Jesus. So, actually, this first little paragraph tells us that there is not much difference between Orthodox Christians and Roman Catholics. So, we should even be careful to call Orthodox Christians Christians, because except from accepting the Pope and his supremacy on the Church, they have very much the very same dogma, and most and for all, they have very much the very same tradition, which they put above the Bible, as does the Roman Catholic Church. So be very careful who you are going to label Christian. 
since the introduction of the all-conquering ASB, that is the alternative service book, in which the words of the communion service are almost identical to those used in the Roman Catholic Mass, Catholic doctrine within the Anglican Church is encountering less and less resistance from evangelicals. Anglo-Catholics are well organized at the national level and through organizations like Church in Danger they have greatly assisted ecumenical progress. John Selwyn Gummer, a cabinet minister and a former very influential member of the Anglican Synod, spoke for the great majority of today's Anglo-Catholics when he said, quote, Our history, our religion, our civilization all stem from the common fount of Western Christendom. Our Roman Catholic brothers are working with us under the inspired leadership of the Pope for the establishment of Christ's kingdom. Unquote. Well, I can't help here to make a little comment. Our history, religion, our civilization stems from the common fount of Western Christendom. Well, if he says so, then first of all, you have to ask yourself, if you want to agree with Mr. John Selwyn Gummer here, what does he call Christendom? Probably Roman Catholicism. I don't say that, I say probably. And if that is, well, Catholicism is not Christianity. Our Roman Catholic brothers, he says. Well, Roman Catholics call people like us, who are Protestants, who are Bible-believing Christians, well, what they call us is something else, but what they call the normal, quote-unquote, normal Protestant, <coughs> separated brothers and sisters. That's because that was stated that way at the Second Vatican Council in 1962 to 1965. But are we true Bible-believing Christians, true Protestants that adhere to the Bible, are we separated brothers from pagans? I don't think so. And he says, together with these separated brothers of the Roman Catholic Church, from his point of view, under the inspired leadership of the Pope for the establishment of Christ's kingdom we are working. Now first and for all if he speaks of an inspired leadership of the Pope of Rome that tells me very very clear that this person of course does not identify the office of the papacy, the Pope of Rome as the biblical, historical and prophetic antichrist because he works together with him. And working together for the establishment of Christ's kingdom. As far as I know the Bible, Christ said at a certain place, My kingdom is not from hence. If my kingdom were of this world, my soldiers would fight. Right? So the Pope's idea is, of course, because he sees himself as the vicar of Christ, Vicarius Filii Dei, to establish Christ's kingdom, his kingdom on earth, a united, a universal, a Catholic kingdom. But Christ said, my kingdom is not of this world. So, again, we have to ask ourselves, what are we working for? Who are we believing? Who do we trust in? And who is our Savior, the Pope or Jesus Christ? Ecclesia, the author continues, the Society for Anglo-Catholics in Britain, reacting to the prospect of women priests in the Church of England, argued in its newsletter that, quote, there are many who will decide that the Rome Ward path is the proper one in the event of an apostate Church of England, unquote. Shall I read that again, that you can really very well let it sink in? There are many who will decide that the Rome Ward path is the proper one in the event of an apostate Church of England. Very clearly it says here, we have to go back under the Church of Rome or otherwise we fall into 
apostasy, not understanding biblically that going back to Rome is the apostasy. The ascendancy of liberals in the Anglican leadership and their sympathy towards the multi-faith movement has distracted the attention of followers of Christ from what may prove to be the greater threat that of counterfeit religion and the deception we are twice warned by the Lord in Matthew chapter 24 in the verses 4 and 24. Quote, then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great things and wonders, and so much, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Unquote. Now, one very strong example of what Christ warned us here about is the Roman Catholic Mass, is the Eucharist, when the priest holds up that little wafer bread and speaks the Latin words hoc est corpus meum and by that commands Christ off his throne in heaven into this little bread and that little bread actually changes into the full divinity, humanity, body, blood and soul of our Lord Jesus Christ. The problem is, if you do not believe this the absolutely this dogma of transubstantiation, if you do not believe it, you are cursed. You are anathema. That was also spoken at the Council of Trent and absolutely 100% confirmed at the Second Vatican Council, the so-called ecumenical council that we are speaking here in this whole book more or less about. And Christ warned us because if the priest says in this bread is the whole substance, body, soul, divinity, humanity, flesh and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, what is that else than any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not, as the Lord warned us. The ecumenists of ARCIC have contrived to bridge all doctrinal differences with the likely exception of the infallibility of the Pope. So, we have no problem with all Catholic doctrine except for the infallibility of the Pope. That is maybe a little stumble block, so let's see it. Papal primacy is seen as the likely compromise which has already been taken on board by the leadership of the Anglican Church. The almost total application from the reformed position of the interchurch process is devastating and greatly weakens a church already perceived to be in difficulties. Are the pagan traditions being renewed or are the pagan traditions being discarded? Those honoring the memories of Cranmer, Latimer and Ridley, who helped draft the Church of England's 39 articles and who died for their Protestant faith, understandably seek to know, lest it all happen again. Now this 39 articles that I've just read about from the Church of England, I looked them up on the internet a few days ago when I was preparing for this reading. And I think that that would be a wonderful and interesting video to make about these 39 articles of the Anglican, in that time, Protestant Church, because <coughs> the reformers Cranmer, Latimer and Ridley helped draft these Church of England 39 articles. And I looked a little bit into that, and I don't understand how a Bible-believing Christian can sign these 39 articles. But that I will probably go into when I come to the, or when I get the chance to make a video on these 39 articles. The prophetic scriptures concerning the end time make clear that this is just what will happen, and men and women will be called to die for faith, for their faith once again. Many critics of ecumenism predict that church unity under the supremacy of Rome will rapidly lead to a fresh outbreak of bigotry and persecution. 
They believe that the behind-the-scenes political power of Catholicism is greatly underestimated already, and that when church and state are reunited, such power will become irresistible. I agree with every word written in this last paragraph. Many critics of ecumenism predict that church unity under the supremacy of Rome, of the Pope, will rapidly lead to a fresh outbreak of bigotry and persecution. Of course, because then everybody is forced into idol worship. They believe that the behind-the-scenes political power of Catholicism is greatly underestimated already, and that is what I have been saying all along. We should always call into our memory that the Roman Catholic Church in the first place is a political entity. It is the pagan Roman Empire baptized with the name, with the garments of Christianity, but it still is the political Roman pagan empire. Nothing has changed there. Rome never changes. And we've read that before in other um, chapters of this book and we understood that Rome never changes. And I think there will also come a very profound sentence. I think it is in this chapter or on the next um, that I've read that dealing with this casistry and sophistry that they are using. I don't know if I read that already or, you know, <laughs> sometimes I lose a little bit track, but I know that it was in this book. So when I come to this later here, I will probably make a point out of it. <clears throat> but we can never forget and never underestimate that Rome is a political power. And when you look to the United States of America today, for example, and I don't think that Europe is any better, so don't get me wrong, I'm not bashing on America, but when you look at America, United States of America, you see that all the churches are 501c3 tax-exempt status. And that means that these churches are actually government agencies. And you don't bite the hand that feeds you. So you have already at least the forerunner, if not already the starting, of the combining of church and state. And isn't that something Americans are so proud of, that they have church and state separate? Let's see what the future brings. But now we're going to take a little look into the persecution of Protestants today. In Protestant countries such as Britain and the United States of America, the Roman Catholic Church appears moderate and tolerant. But in Catholic countries such as Peru, Chile, Argentina, Colombia and Mexico, and countries in Africa like Uganda and Zambia, also short on experience with democracy, but where the Catholic Church is strong, Rome's other side has shown itself in intolerance and cruelties towards Protestants. The fact is that in such countries Protestant missionaries are being persecuted for their faith and sometimes tortured and killed. Whether such, ha whether such happenings are represented as the excess of Marxist insurgency or of liberation theology, Cardinal Bellarmine remind you, if they surface at all, they certainly do not get proper reporting in the Western press. Of course, because the press, Western, Eastern, Northern or Southern, all press is controlled by the Roman Catholic Church. It is their inherent right, it is their birthright. And you can read that in the Roman papal encyclicals of Miranda Prosus and Intermirifica. Just read it for yourselves and you will know that. Of course they put here and there a Jew in the front, but that's something I already dealt with in Hour of the Truth in the episode called It's Simply Amazing. Get a grip of that. For example, the slaughter of evangelicals by fanatics in many different parts of Mexico in the 1950s was not dissimilar to the accounts that history has left us of the St. Bartholomew's massacre of French Huguenot Protestants in the 16th century. 1572 in October. Within a month, a hundred and thousand Protestants were slaughtered in the streets. Men, women, children alike. Flayed, beheaded, hung, burned alive, 
all kinds of atrocities done to these protestants during the St. Bartholomew massacre. And the Pope even issued a medal, a coin, remembering this quote-unquote wonderful event, as he called it. And for that I think you can turn to my reading of Babylon Mystery Religion. I'll show the coin in there, maybe here too. And I even read the quote that the Pope said because he went into prayer on that day and thanked God for this massacre. Now, the Mexican atrocities were reported at the time by the magazine Tiempo, a large circulation non-religious news magazine in Mexico City, and also by the Catholic newspapers Excelsior and Zocalo. Excelsior, the Mexico City Daily, reported that a 35-year-old preacher and his young companion, who were distributing Christian tracts, were stoned to death on the 15th of January 1989 by, quote, more than 100 angry Catholics, unquote. So, are this separated brethren? Is that how you deal with your brother? You stone him to death? None of the attackers has been arrested, although the state government claims to have identified most of them. And you can read for that in Christianity Today, 3rd of March, 1989. At midday, on Sunday the 24th, February 1991, a mob armed with cudgels, axes and machetes destroyed the homes of 17 Presbyterian families of the Tzeltal Indian tribe of southern Mexico, according to Presbyterian pastor Pedro Arias. Reports from Amantenango, Del Valle, where the incident took place, revealed that the Roman Catholic group responsible said it intended to expel the Presbyterians from their towns, stating they, quote, want nothing to do with Protestants, unquote. Hundreds of evangelicals have been evicted from their land in, rec in recent years over disputes regarding the practice of their faith, according to the Evangelical Times in May 1991. In Colombia in 1948, a reactionary government attained power with the help of the Roman Catholic Church. A concordat was signed with the Vatican under which severe restrictions were placed on Protestants. From 1948 to 1959, 116 Protestants were killed. 66 Protestant churches or chapels were burned or bombed. And over 200 schools were closed. The Vatican appeared to approve these things, for the Archbishop of Bogota was promoted to Cardinal by Pope John XXIII in 1960. And you can read this in Lorraine Bettner's book, Roman Catholicism. And I'm going to read that book in the future on my channel. Now look at Africa. The Fellowship of Christ's Disciples wrote in August 1990 of the difficulties evangelicals were experiencing in Kampala, the capital of Uganda, a country they describe as a Catholic stronghold. Quote, We are a group of disciples from different <coughs> Pentecostal churches who meet daily for discipleship training. We are so excited because this country has a population of about 17 million, of which about 50% are Roman Catholics. Here our days are numbered. This is the only time we can use to alert and warn the body of Jesus Christ. Already the true believers have been banned by the Roman Catholic bishops from the media. They have such a big influence that they can even cause the government to do such a thing. Unquote. Now, I just want to go very, very shortly into that because we are talking about Africa. We are talking here about Uganda, a country that is next to Zaire or Congo, whatever you want to call it. And at least here in Europe, I don't know about the United States of America, but here in Europe we have had many, many reports on the Hutus, which is one tribe, killing another tribe, I don't remember that name anymore, and about all that bloodshed that was there. But what they never told us was that the underlying reason was religion. It has nothing to do with the one tribe killing another. It has everything to do with religion and to get rid of real Protestantism within Africa. And you will see this a little bit later on because I'm going to go into that too. 
An evangelist in Zambia, whose name is withheld, wrote to Worldwide Outreach in Santa Fe, New Mexico, in much the same way. Quote, My country has plunged into misery. The body of Christ is constantly facing onslaughts. It's true, Catholicism is ruling the land. Politics, social and spiritual aspects have been sold to the Vatican. Every effort to evangelize is being thwarted. I wonder if you know that the Catholics, through their agents in Parliament, have passed a law banning the formation of any other Christian ministry. Religious freedom is slowly declining and respect for the Pope is mounting. Unquote. Well, in the first few videos I always inserted a picture of a new law that was passed, I think it was in June this year, 2016, and today we write the 13th of September, so it's about three months old, that there is a new law passed in Russia where it is forbidden to evangelize outside of the church. So that means when you go into a pub, into a restaurant, whatever, a club, and you talk to someone and you talk to him about Jesus Christ, or you do that at your home with friends you are meeting there, or you are doing that via the internet, every time when you do that outside of the controlled church, you are breaking the law. You are not to evangelize outside of the church. And how can you evangelize within the church when everybody who is a true believer knows that he shouldn't enter a church? Well, you can't. And here in Africa, it's absolutely the same thing. And it says so. I wonder if you know that the Catholics, through their agents in Parliament, have passed a law banning the formation of any other Christian ministry. Religious freedom is slowly declining and respect for the Pope is mounting. Don't forget this book was published in 1993 and we are now 23 years later already. A lot has happened in the past and a lot is going to happen in the future. And the thumb screws will some thumb screws, sorry, <laughs> will will always be fastened only in one direction and that is not to lose. All of this, the author continues, seems to be paying major dividends for the Roman Church. During the Pope's 1990 tour of African countries, the press agency Reuters revealed that the number of Roman Catholics in Africa has grown from 55 million in 1980 to 79 million in 1990 and is expected to top 100 million by the end of the century. Now, when I yesterday read the German part of this book, I looked it up during the reading in the Internet, and I found out that there was a statistic that told me that in Africa, in the year 2004, so which is 14 years after 1990, when they speak about 79 million, and expected 100 million by the end of the century, in 2004, Catholics in Africa were... 149 million. We turn to Spain. It was only a quarter of a century ago in 1964 that in Spain a warehouse containing Bibles of the British and Foreign Bible Society was burned down by the government authorities. At that time, Protestants were debarred from holding any public office and the professions such as medicine, nursing, law, teaching and banking were for the most part closed to them. Protestant schools were banned, as were Protestant marriage services and funeral services in many towns. No Protestant literature could be published or distributed without a license. So now you're going to say, well, okay, but we in America, we did the same thing when we were in the colonies. Catholics were banned from office. Catholics could not uh, celebrate mass and so on and so on and so on. And we had the same persecution. Yeah, but that's different because you didn't want the Catholics to take over your political power because you know that Rome is first and for all a political power and not a spiritual power. You had religious freedom over there in the United States of America during the colonies because you could worship the God of the Bible the way that you pleased. You cannot do that today anymore in the churches because they don't follow the Bible. They follow the ecumenical movement. 
And here in Spain, which is one of the, if not the most Catholic country in the whole world, we read that even in 1964, which is not so far away, only 50 years from today where we are, that people were blocked from public office and professions as medicine, nursing, law, teaching and banking. Of course, when you go into banking, you've got to be a knight of Malta, eh? <laughs> so, <clears throat> the problem is, the Roman Catholics were whining about they needed religious freedom in the United States of America at that time. But here, do they give it to Protestants? And the difference is, in America you still have more or less a very Protestant mindset. So the Roman Catholic Church has to act in a different way than it can act in what I've just read, Africa or Spain, for example, where most of the population is Roman Catholic. Concerning the situation in Spain at that time, American sociologist Paul Blanchard wrote, quote, the same Pope, John XXIII, who permits American bishops to declare in the United States that they favor the separation of church and state in this non-Catholic country, encourages his Spanish bishops to pursue a directly opposite policy in Catholic Spain. It is the Vatican and the Franco government that jointly deny to all Protestant churches and Jewish synagogues those liberties which leaders of the church in the United States profess to believe in. Unquote. There has been improvement in the situation since Franco's fascist regime was succeeded by the new democracy. However, religious discrimination, often severe, still operates in many parts of Spain. It was only barely two years ago that Protestants were given access to the holy ground of public cemeteries, usually owned <coughs> or controlled by Roman Catholic Church. Until then, they had been required to bury their dead in public plots set aside for atheists, criminals and paupers. In other predominantly countries, Catholic countries, with demarti uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> in other predominantly Catholic countries with democratic traditions such as Italy, France, where Catholicism is mainly nominal, and the south of Germany, the Protestant minorities are very strongly opposed to the ecumenical movement, <clears throat> although swimming against a very powerful tide. Hard-won freedoms by the Reformation, let me remind you, Hard-worn freedoms prevent persecutions today. But as we saw before and during the Second World War, the establishing of fascist or totalitarian regimes can swiftly unleash religious persecution. This was the sentence I was waiting for. Establishing of fascist or totalitarian regimes can swiftly unleash religious persecution. Turn for more information on that <coughs> to the book reading I did on Behind the Dictators. And you see the connection of the Roman Catholic Church, the Vatican, with the Third Nazi Reich. And then think about what happened after that in the United States of America. Your country today is ruled not by Congress, but by executive orders of your president. Doesn't that seem very, very strong to be on the way to be a totalitarian regime? It's just a question with which king or queen you will elect later this year, who maybe then comes out in the open when you do not expect it. A letter written by the pastor of an evangelical church in central Italy to the, uh, to Church Society's Cross and Way magazine, published late in 1990, illustrates very well the Protestant perspective within a predominantly Roman Catholic country, which Italy absolutely is. So we read this quote. We believe that many of those who are in favor of this move towards union with the Vatican are unaware of the real nature of Roman Catholicism. Probably their own experience has been limited to contacts with official representatives of the Roman Catholic world, while they remain almost totally ignorant of what it means to live in a country where it is the dominant religion. 
as regards the incredible influence which the Vatican has on society in Italy, the following is just the tip of the iceberg. The Roman Catholic Church openly supports that party or relative majority in the coalition government, dictating many of their decisions. During elections, Roman Catholics are openly directed from the pulpit to vote for the said party, which is the Christian Democrats, and through the same party exert control over the most popular television and radio channels on a national level. <coughs> And you can probably also include the newspapers. And when you think of Italy, what I'm talking here about, think back of the time of the reign of Berlusconi, who was a media magnet, who held a lot of television stations, radio stations and newspapers in his possession. Tja, inter mirifica. Everything I have to say to that. Thus, the quote continues... Millions of Italians have been indoctrinated by biased news coverage, the tragic situation in Northern Ireland being another obvious example. Yeah, really. Millions of Italians have been indoctrinated by biased news coverage. <laughs> I think that goes for the United States of America even more, and that goes for Europe in the same way. When you check the news channels in the United States of America, how many percent is truth and how many percent is lies of what they tell in a so-called news show? They even call it a show to indoctrinate you with their propaganda that you do not know is being paid for by the Roman Catholic Church. Again, we continue in the quote, Whereas the Protestant Reformation has even today left its mark on society, those countries which remained under papal domination, like Italy, usually have one thing in common, an almost total lack of consideration for those who do not share their religious beliefs. Evangelical believers in Italy have little or no access to the media, often find their right of freedom of witness obstructed by the authorities while the Roman Catholic Church enjoys total freedom and vast financial benefits from the state. Unquote. The continuing persecution of tiny minorities of evangelicals by state Catholicism contrasts sharply with the benevolent tolerance extended to Catholics in Western Protestant countries, what I mentioned before. It was in Spain that the Inquisition carried out its worst excesses, but in many other parts of the world it has been extremely effective in controlling peoples and nations. Its tribunal has never been abolished, nor has the Roman Church never renounced physical force to obtain spiritual ends. There has never been any repentance or apology for the Inquisition. Where there is infallibility, real repentance is impossible. The true Church has always thrived under persecution and prospered among underprivileged minorities. The greatest threat to the grip of Roman Catholicism and the ambitions of the papacy probably comes from that spectacular growth of the gospel in Latin America and Africa and among the Hispanic and other less privileged Catholic communities in the United States of America. That finishes chapter 5 of All Roads Lead to Rome from Michael de Semlian and we will continue next time on chapter 6 very, very interesting chapter called The Papacy and Political Power. And if you want to know really, really deep the influence of the papacy in the political power, I can advise you to go to First Amendment Radio, get to the archives or get to his YouTube channel and look at the playlists from Tom Fress from Inquisition Update reading last year The Global Vatican and from... Uh, James Atkin Wiley, Rome and Civil Liberty. When you go through that, I mean, when you put them both together, it's almost, I don't know, about 200 broadcasts of three quarters of an hour. 
It's a lot of stuff. It's a lot of knowledge. But when you go through that, you will never ever have to have a history lesson again. You got it. Tom Fress provided it for you in that two readings. Wonderfully done. So you can either go to the YouTube channel of First Amendment Radio or go to the site directly and uh, with a little monthly contribution you can get access to the archives. I don't sell any uh, <laughs> membership of First Amendment Radio but the news that is provided there or the information that is provided there is something that you hardly find on the internet anywhere else. And when Nicholas says you have to pay for that, okay, then you have to pay for that. You can make it up, uh, whether you go to YouTube and watch it for free, or you go to his archives and pay, I don't know, seven, ten dollars a month. You have to see that. I don't care. It's just an advice that I'm going to give you how you can obtain this wonderful information Tom Fress put out. And of course, you can also check my channels, because Tom and I often work together, and often something is published on my channel from First Amendment Radio. Oh, not, not from First Amendment Radio, but from Inquisition Update. Tom Fress. So, okay, uh, I've been ranting long enough, almost 40 minutes. Again, a few minutes longer than my German recording. I don't know how I do that. <laughs> At first, when I start to read, I think, oh, hope I've, hopefully I can get to the time that I used in German. And in the end, I said, oh, I'm already three or four minutes above it again. Anyway, um, that was Chapter 5, Ecumenical Dangers of All Roads Lead to Rome by Michael de Semlian from Jogler 66, Hour of the Truth. And until next time, God bless you and bye-bye. We, as Bible-believing Christians, we know that the hand that is behind ISIS, the hand that is behind Al-Qaeda, is the same hand that is behind the United States of America government, that is behind the European Union government, and that is behind all the armies in the world, and that is behind all these um, mercenary companies out in the world, like XE, or formerly called Blackwater, run by Knights of Malta, etc., etc. So this is something that you really have to understand. This is all just a theater. And the point is, where is this theater going to lead to? When you are a Bible-believing Christian, you know that in the end times, Jesus warned us in Matthew 24, there will be wars, wars, and rumors of wars. And we know that the Antichrist, by peace, will destroy many and so on, and so on, and so on. I could start citing the whole Bible up and down right now with citations like this to tell you what it's all about. But I don't have to sing to the choir or preach to the choir. You as Bible-believing Christians already know that. So the only thing that I ask of you is don't be caught in their game. Because when you are and you play their game, you have to play by their rules. And their rules are not Christ's rules. So the only thing that I can advise you of is, okay, take that information in what happens about there. Pray for the people that these victims are being taken good care of. And that they are just deceived people, that they maybe have a chance by going through this situation, maybe they have a way to find to Christ in this way. Maybe they have a way to find to the real truth. I mean, these people are Muslims and coming from Muslim countries and coming to so-called, quote-unquote, Christian countries. Of course, the Roman Catholic Church is not Christian. Of course, the Protestant churches today don't preach any protest anymore. All right, I know that. But still, here and there, it is possible that a grain falls on the ground that can fall on fruitful ground, even with these refugees and the whole situation that is coming up. And that is the hope that we should have as Bible-believing Christians, and that is the prayer that we should use every day when we address our Lord to pray for our enemies as we pray for our friends. Because Jesus said, love your enemies and love your neighbor.